Hi, I'm James Nela Green, Professor of Brazilian History and Culture at Brown University and the National Co-Coordinator of the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. This program is part of the Democracy Observatory and is supported by the Washington Brazil Office. This is Brazil Unfiltered. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Ana Paula Vargas. Ana Paula has worked for the last 20 years in campaigns in Brazil fighting for human rights and social justice. She is currently the Brazil Program Director at Amazon Watch. And while she is from Bahia, Brazil, she now lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. Paula is a member of the US Network for Democracy in Brazil, and Amazon Watch is a partner organization with the Washington Brazil office. I'm very happy to welcome her to this program. So Paula, I'm glad you could be with us today. It's a pleasure. I'm super happy to be here. This program is really important, even more in that at that moment in Brazil. So thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here talking Great. to you. Paula, why don't you first tell us a little about your, your background, your history? How did you get involved in environmental activism? Sure. So before getting involved into environmental activism, I think I should say that I am a journalist and I was uh, graduated in Bahia. I'm Brazilian from Salvador. And since the beginning of my career, I have been working or in human rights or with culture. But in this uh, intersection between the two is normally where I thrived. So I have been working with movies or arts, but then I also worked in a bunch of NGOs, collaborating with them to try to um, defend the rights of the minorities, or for a time I was working with children and adolescents, then in the black movement with women. And what happened in the past few years after Bolsonaro uh, got in power is that that work is not only a calling of choices, it become really something essential for those who really understand democracy as a value and something important for the development of everyone and any, like any country. So when I was working in Bahia, I also collaborated for a while with the PT government. Uh, we were a group of students and young people that created a secretary of culture. So we understood from the beginning the importance of public politics, policies and programs that could like defend and guarantee the rights. That experience took me also to work with uh, other NGOs, international NGOs that try to foster uh, rights and progressive movements. And then the indigenous rights and the environmental rights are, were part of that universe. Again, uh, repeating what I say, like in 2018, when Bolsonaro got into power, the work of all of us activists, human rights defenders, social, engaged people got more intense and intensifies and the Amazon and its people, the forest people became a huge target. Then it was not a choice, it was a calling. I was already here. I came to study, like I came here to study English and I thought I would be in a sabbatical time doing screenwriting, study screenwriting in UCLA. But then it was not possible not to get involved into the US dem uh, democracy and uh, the, from the beginning, and we started to create and do protests, actions to protest against the fires, to try to denounce Bolsonaro government. And in that moment, it was when Amazon Watch, with whom I, I was already collaborating as an activist and volunteer, they opened a position for uh, someone to coordinate the work they did, they do in Brazil. So we have a group of consultants in Brazil and I coordinate the work of those people from here. Could you tell us a little, our listeners and viewers, a little bit more about the history of Amazon Watch? Sure. Amazon Watch is now celebrating its 25th year. And from the beginning, it was created as a nonprofit to defend and protect the Amazon forest. But there are many ways of doing this. So what I think differentiate our work is that from the beginning, Amazon Watch understand that was not only the forest and the nature that was important, but mainly, if we are worried about the future of the planet and the climate, we should consider those that are the guardians of the, those environments and biomes for centuries, for thousands of years. So Amazon Watch is an environmental and human rights organization because we understood that defender defenders, those that are the forest protectors and guardians are also the best way of keep the forest standing. So Amazon Watch now, 
we have uh, groups, uh, we have uh, nucleus working in Ecuador, in Peru, and in Brazil, and we also have work in Colombia, so four of the nine Amazonian countries, and we work based here in California, but with teams in those countries. And these teams of consultants are there doing a range of activities there from the solidarity uh, support for the indigenous movements, quilombolas movements, those that are there protecting the forests. We also do advocacy work. We also work with corporate responsibility and campaigns. And right now, what we are doing in Brazil, focusing this year, is starting a big work on mining, industrial mining in Garimpo. So let's uh, let's think first about the way the the Bolsonaro government has has actually had an effect on the Amazon from uh, from the environment to the millions of people who call this region their home. What's happened since Bolsonaro came to power? Before understanding what is happening now, it's important to connect Bolsonaro project with the military project. We know that during the 80s and before the 80s, like the, the time when the dictatorship was there was when the program of development of the uh, economy based on extractivism and based on big infrastructure projects in the Amazon started. So we were witness of almost a genocide of the indigenous peoples at the time due to a bunch of diseases that the white brought, but also displacements, uh, forced displacements and a lot of violence. Now, we have like improved and we have in the past decades understood the importance of the environment and respect of human rights. But since Bolsonaro started as uh, started his government, even before as a campaign promise, he starts saying that one of the bases of his agenda was not a centimeter more to the indigenous people. So Bolsonaro is a representative of two of the main enemies of those peoples and of the environment. He is connected to the agribusiness sector. There are now, as you unfortunately may be aware, freeing all the pesticides to get into the table of the people. Like so now we are really poisoning the food and we are destroying the nature and the forest with cattle ranch basically for like exploitation. So it's not even like to feed the people. And uh, we also know that he is connected from the beginning with some militias and with the guiding pool. He has a history of trying- so just, just for our, our, our viewers, our uh, listeners who don't know Portuguese, a garimpo is a, is a miner, right? Yeah, it's a white cat miner. So there's a differentiation, the way that we call the industrial mining that's done, those done by huge companies and corporations. And initially, the white cat mining in Brazil was in small scale. Now they're even a bit, be like clever trying to call it artisanal mining, maybe with like, I don't know, thinking that we like hipsters word, but it's not different anymore. It's not a small scale. It's not doing for, uh, so, so for the sustainability of like small communities. Now the white cat mining that we call Garimpo in Brazil is a large scale activities with finance, with exploitations, with tons of investments, with a network that are involved, that involves militias and uh, illegality, criminals, but also politicians, companies, and financiers. So this is a really um, complex world that Bolsonaro is one of their like defenders. But what we are now, we recently have uh, launched a report was on industrial mining because we as an organization understand that since we cannot negotiate with someone as Bolsonaro, since we cannot make those like one person like his or his followers to get into reason and understand the importance of preserving the forest or defending human rights, we have to go and try to mobilize and pressure those actors that can make him do that. So that's why we try to find the chain of complicity. So who is the complicit in destruction? Who are those that enable those companies and those po political actors to move forward this destruction agenda? So well, who finances the destruction of the Amazon? I mean, these, are, uh, like the garim, garimperos, the people who are, as you said, wildcat miners, uh, traditionally have been individuals or small clusters of people doing mining in an area illegally or not. Uh, but you said it's become wide scale. Is this being financed by mining companies or how does the system work? There are 
two different universes that we are now addressing and like the one of the white cat mining the illegal mining because all of these activities is illegal it's happening illegally it is not a transparent change exactly because it's a illegal chain so, so wait a minute just so uh, just to understand why is it illegal in other words it's the government has passed laws that pro prohibit people from mining or is it the fact that they're mining in territories that they have no right to enter what's the what's the story there what they are mining in the Amazon, and it, unfortunately it happens and we know already their impacts. But what we are talking about here is the attempt to try to open protected territories to mining. And what are those protected territories? We have the indigenous lands, they are demarcated, and that the constitution, the Brazilian constitutions, understand as an area that the indigenous people has their self um, uh, proclaim and they are the one that has to consent and decide what's, what will be happening there, but it is free from industry activities. It was understood as an area of protection, the same way of conservation unities, national parks, and all the areas that are there to be preserved. So mining in those areas are illegal, and that's what we are talking about. So, so these wild cat miners are entering indigenous lands that are protected under the 1988 constitution and also natural la lands that are protected by environmental laws to protect uh, areas that need to be you know uh, prote protected against exploration extraction so that's that's why uh, they're considered illegal miners is that correct exactly. they are they are proceeding as the land grabbers they are so not supposed to be there like for instance right now in the yanomami territory that is one of the most um target by those people, they have more than 20,000 miners acting illegally in their lands. And that is not different from what, what is happening with the Kayapo people and the Roraima, or even like the people in Pará, like the Shikrim and Munduruku in Pará, are, their lands are being invaded. Like the territory are now being invaded with people that initially we saw a lot of like of those activities to try to do illegal logging but now it's not only illegal logging anymore. They are trying to mine. And there is a coming back to the difference issue of the finance, that chain of the illegal mining is still to be uh, discovered. We, and not only us at Amazon Watch, but a group of organizations are trying to investigate those actors that are behind this, because we know there are many flaws in the system that surveil and monitor the exploration of gold, mainly it's gold. And many countries, international countries are uh, buying gold from Brazil, thinking that they are buying legal, legal gold, but the quantity of gold that are produced legally are not the one exported. So it's not clear that chain and it's being right now investigated. What we have already data and we are trying to show now in a super important moment is who is backing and finance the industrial mining that are trying to pressure to enter indigenous lands. And why I'm saying that that's now super important. Because of the war between Russia and Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine, Bolsonaro starts saying that we have a crisis in the importation of potassium that are used to help to create a fertilizer, the, to fertilize the soil, and is based on potassium usually. So because of the war, they started today, an emergency, an urgency pledge to put to vote the bill 191 and that bill 191 it's mainly and only cre was created to open indigenous territories to industrial exploitation so he, he's not saying like let's now do that because we want to produce food or because there is a problem or i don't know energy it's because of mining so he's saying and trying once more to justify that opening of lands that should never be open because first is unconstitutional second they even don't need that. There are, there are evidences that there are those miners, minerals and minerals in other area. But furthermore, it makes no sense because to start uh, exploration of potassium in areas that it never had been, it will make, need much more money investments than for exporting from other countries that produces and not from those that are now cannot be selling because of the war. So it's clear an attempt to benefit those companies and we already have a company called Potassio do Brasil that is trying to push to explore potassium inside of indigenous lands. So that's why understanding who are the financiers 
back in those companies that have these interests in indigenous lands and are submitting applications in the national mining agency waiting for it to be legal like we need to review those actors and we need to call them and accountable for those uh, what they can create in terms of destruction if that law is approved so this law cannot even be put to vote to vote uh -huh. and are there u.s corporations involved in uh in the mining uh, enterprises in brazil and the in the amazon region they are not like companies we have like the main companies that now we are uh using as case studies are canadian companies mining companies uh, anglo mining companies we have also peruvian group and brazilian also mining companies but when you study who are the ones financing those companies the us asset managers and the us banks are on the top at the, on the top of the list so we are seeing that in the is a chain of international financiers. We have European banks, we have Brazilian institutions, and we can get a little bit more in detail soon. But it is true that Vanguard, BlackRock, and Capital Group are the top three of the list of investments. They have between 2016 and 2021. In the nine companies that Amazon Watch and APB reviewed and report as actors of that destruction, these mining companies, there were more than $14 billion that those three asset managers had invested. And there are also banks as Bank of America, CD Group banks. So there are a lot of responsibility of money, of people who has money is investing money on the destruction of the Amazon and also on the threats of those people. So you just mentioned a PB, the an indigenous group in Brazil. Could you talk us, uh, to us a little bit more about it? So a PB is now is important to say one of the main core of the resistance of democracy in Brazil. It has not only representativity by like from the entire country, but because of Bolsonaro agenda that is so strong against the environment and against human rights, we see how they are organized and how they are, even with the pandemic, confronting this agenda and putting themselves in the front line of the defense of democracy, of the, of the movement that is defending democracy in Brazil. So we have seen, for instance, last year in 2021, what people here was trying to call the indigenous spring in a reference of the Primavera Arabi, that were for three months settlements like they were camping in Brasilia so thousands and thousands of indigenous people were there in Brasilia protesting against the threats to their territory and to their lives because we need to understand those people are being killed they are being threatened they are leaders that now has to have like really a scheme to be able to live their lives and protect their lives but they're also there to defend what is important to the entire country that is the state of law so we understood how Bolsonaro government is trying to move and push their agenda changing by changing the constitution, by changing the legislation, changing laws. So they are there protesting, calling the attention for what those laws will represent. And they are not only defending their own piece of land, because when they defend the constitution, the Brazilian constitution, they defend my right, my freedom, my freedom to speech, my freedom to protest, but also the health of the people in Brazil, because we all depend on the environment. It's not for nothing. That's important to understand. Like people that are following what is happening in Brazil, there was a paradise of the climate. We didn't have hurricanes. We didn't have like extreme weather. We are suffering with huge flood and drought. And we had a day that Sao Paulo was like covered with dust, like sandstorms. Those are alerts that the nature is telling us like that the agenda of the agribusiness in brazil cannot be growing they cannot be destroying forests to do cattle and to plant soy and indigenous people are the ones saying they're like those laws cannot be changed what is illegal cannot be turned to legal because that's the trick paula many environmental activists in the united states and in europe uh, have been mobilized uh, about the fires in the amazon in, in 2019 they're very concerned about deforestation, but not necessarily concerned about the question of illegal mining. And could you kind of help fine tune the reasons why there should be an understood link between the uh, deforestation of uh, the Amazon and 
the penetration of uh, illegal mining in the region? Sure, and uh, we have, again, it's important to say the impacts of illegal mining with the white cat mining happen, but it's also important for us to put in the same package the risk of legal mining, of the industrial mining, because what we have to understand is like mining should be out of the Amazon. If we want to protect the balance of life in this planet, the climate, we should not allow expansion of mining in the Amazon, even if it's not indigenous lands, but especially indigenous lands because they are already protected. There, the forest is standing. So I think like it's important for us to, to recognize that although agribusiness is now, the, uh, it represents 80% of deforestation that happens in the Amazon, the rates and the numbers of mining, uh, it's increasing. So mining increased rates of deforestation. And since the government Bolsonaro started, the numbers has increased more than 60%. So only in 2021, mining destroyed like 125 square kilometers of rainforest. This is like the largest area since the system that monitor deforestation in Brazil, the DT, that is like an official data has started. So it's also important to say that there is a study by One Earth that has tried to create a scenario that what will happen in case this B191 is proved. So if it's approved with the applications for mining that already exist in the national mining system, will lead like will the appro approval of this this uh, this bill could result in the loss of more than 160 square thousand kilometers. It's like an area larger than England. And so when we understand that threat, we we are aware that there is time to do something because their law is not yet approved. So the difference sometimes of the urgency and why Amazon Watch in Brazil has chosen to find mining right now is because right now is the moment where we could stop that. And mining also deepens climate change. There is also other studies that say that directly mining uh, is responsible for 7% of the emission of uh, dioxide of carbon, but indirectly with all the fuel to make the machines uh, operate and the excavation because they use carbon, uh, largest quantity of fossil fuels, it can come to 28% or worldwide. So it's not enough the impact of this sector as they say it is. But I think like the most important things to understand is that when we are trying to talk about how mining is bad and its impact. And in the other side, we have someone saying, but we need to develop the country. Amazon sometimes have very poor area. We need to bring uh, economic development and social development. It seems that mining is a good thing. And it seems as if like we are here being naive, trying to prevent progress. But many, many other studies confirmed that money does not bring the development or the promise that they say it brings. Like the, the benefits for the communities, we have studies that says that last only for three to five years. And the destruction it leaves when it like leaves the places, it's huge and it brings um, disordinated growth, it brings prostitution, it brings violence. And so all the, also we think, okay, it will gonna bring jobs, but there are many evidences that the jobs of, from mining are one of the worst type of job that can also like can exist because like first the salaries had decreased 12%, even if during the pandemic, those mining companies are making billions. But the substance, like the dangers that this sector represents with the possibility of low, high, like heavy minerals uh, contaminated and disease and accidents. Um, it's mining is considered one of the industries that most kills, mutilates and mentally affect workers in Brazil. And that is already happening to end, like to, to finish the argument. We also see the government saying that mining is good, but good for who? Because to for the mining industry being good to a small city, it will have to have taxes that can be converted into education, into like benefits for the communities. But those benefits, those profits do not stay in Brazil. Like 
Minas Gerais, that is the biggest uh, state that has like a huge mining industry, it's like the, the most important one. And also Pará has lost billions, billions of uh, thousands of reais because there are a lot of tax invasions, misappropriation. Vale, for instance, that is operating in Minas Gerais and in Brazil, it's target of a lot of investigations uh, by parliamentary community, uh, community of inquiry in Pará because of like putting money in fiscal paradise and taxes paradises. So the benefits of mining never stays in the place that it goes to. So who is interested in mining? The benefit will never be for the population that is there. Do, do defenders point to any place that in which mining has caused uh, ongoing uh, prosperity and development? Or is there some kind of example that they use in somewhere in Brazil that says, well, it works here? No, that's what I'm saying. Like, these studies only shows the opposite. This, this uh, Instituto Escolhas is one analyzing, like, this uh, argument. So they study 73 cities that uh, are this the headquarters for extraction of gold and diamonds from 2005 and 2016. And they're like this, they, they study they discovered that the supposed benefit that was the one that says like only lasts for three or five years. And so it doesn't really bring develop development. So, and it's not, I don't have this and they cannot show that data. What we also know is that a lot of like communities seen, seen as the Kayapo that has value there so many judicial battles, so many lawsuits to try to give them uh, uh, reparations. And it is so hard for them to like have benefits. They, are, they have their health committed, they are sick, the rivers are polluted, they cannot fish, they cannot have their activities. It's changed the whole community cultural because they have like rituals in the river, they cannot do it anymore. And the doctors and the hospital are from Valley. So what the community says is that many times they don't think they tell the truth and they have all the data. So they have the control of the health, of the health system. And we cannot forget what happened in Brumadinho Mariana. This is the worst environmental crime in Brazil that like those dams bursted. And so far until today, the communities are not being like repaired and the river is killed and the city is totally destroyed. And what they're trying to do in the Amazon could be worse than in this, those areas. So you mentioned Vale, which is one of the largest mining in industries in, in Brazil that was originally state owned, was privatized and Anglo-American is two companies that promised they would not continue to do indigenous uh, mine, mining and in indigenous territories. Have they kept their promise? Jim, what they did was big announcement, PR announcement, saying that they have no interest in exploring those lands. But the reality is that those requests are still in the system of the National Mining Agency in Brazil. While those requests, these applications are there, appearing as active, there are still threats. And why is that? Because, for instance, if the B191 is approved right now and they just say mining now is legal, they already have that in the system that works as a market reserve. So there's not only, we don't need only someone says that we're not doing it. They need to make sure that those requests are out of the system. And of course, they will say, oh, but that is not our task. That is the task of the Brazilian government to take those applications. But let's say, if you know it's illegal, why are you going to ask for explore research there if you are committed with social environmental uh, and you, human rights and indigenous rights? And that's important to understand because like while during the time that a PB and Amazon Watch was doing this research of the applications of mining in indigenous land, Vali has submitted two new applications. So if it was true that they are not interested, why they are submitting new ones? So there is a movement of asking for some sort of changing, and that is the tricky part that we need to understand and keep pushing that they call removal of interference. And both Valley and Anglo Americans doing this. So they still have their applications there. So Anglo also announces after the big campaign that a PB Amazon Watch and the Munduruku people try to like really pressure. We have calls with the directors of the company saying that they have to give enough. They announced that they were not 
uh, explore anymore. But again, it, it was still there, all the requests. What we are asking the national mining, mining to do is to draw a line that will remove the interferences. Because when we say that we have applications that interferes with indigenous lands, it's not only the ones in the middle. We have some companies that have requests for doing in the middle. But if the area that you want to explore touches the border, it's already an interference. But imagine mining needs water. And those companies normally use and look for places where there are rivers and water sources. So do you think that if you have even like um, uh, exploration of mine in closer to an area that is not inside, but the river is the same, the impact of those communities already suffered. So that's what they're doing. No, we are not wanting to explore inside indigenous lands. They are like cutting all the borders and being around, waiting until the law change. Hmm. So um, you mentioned shaming of international companies, pointing out in international campaigns the involvement of Canadian and European companies and investors in uh, the mining industry. What other strategies of resistance have developed? Is, is there a way that we can really stop the destruction of the Amazon rainforest? Is it inevitable that it will continue to be destroyed by these economic interests? What can we do about it? I think this is also a choice of how we want to keep our sanity and our life as a, not only a citizen of the world, but a human being. If we start thinking that it's lost, we are giving the enemy munition and space to work. So no, we can never think it's lost because, for instance, after the whole mobilization of the 80s that we have, like someone from like artists like Sting going to Brazil and announced the destruction of the Amazon forest, there were improvements. We have we arrived in a moment where the forestation was decreasing and decreasing. We were be able to change the situation. We demarcated indigenous territories. So there were advances. So we have to understand that those things are possible so that we don't give up because the tractor of destruction is huge and they're powerful, but we are also important and powerful. And we see, for instance, funds as the Norwegian fund that is stopped investing in Bali after the disasters of Brumadinho in Bali. We saw like groups as Casino in France that say like, we are not doing business with Brazil anymore if the first station uh, continues to increase. So big nations as the US, instead of being publicly saying, oh, Brazil is now committing to deforestation, to stop deforestation, so maybe we're gonna make like this huge plan for the Amazon and believe in them. That is not, Kerry, what should be, you should be saying in your Twitter, that Bolsonaro is now committed, he will never be committed. So it's to use the power for those big nations to try to pressure for changes. And Europe is doing this, like many of like European nations is writing to Brazil and is pressuring for that. So this is in the macro, political level that we could do that. Companies also has a, they have a huge power. We have big financiers, they're there and they have policies, policies that says that they are not investing, that like they have like sustainable investment and they care about the environment and they care about human rights. So it's on them now also to make sure that the companies they invest in are responsible and to monitor and to divest in case they are not they keep violating those rights. And as citizens, we are also not only clients of those banks and companies that we can like make our voice heard, but we can also support the movements of those in Brazil. So the most important right now is to show solidarity. And solidarity is not only like watching CNN or writing Facebook, oh, you see what is happening. Like there are ways of engaging in the fight, like supporting those movements, being part of it, because that's what we need. We need more voices and we need those people to understand that we are not complicit in the destruction as well. Yeah, I would. I want to strongly recommend to our listeners to go to amazonwatch.org and check out the full report. It's a very informative document that will help you understand the questions that, that Paula has been raising today. So um, before I ask a final question, I wanted to know if there was anything that you'd like to say that we haven't covered uh, in, in our conversation. I think I would like also to invite people to watch the videos because sometimes reports are so dense and we had a dense report of many data that can be used to show impacts. We have data to show uh, 
what the companies are doing, financiers, but we also want, because like APIB is such a strong partner, to give voices for the impacted communities. So in this edition, we have four videos in this website that shows the communities, the chief is the traditional people in Riverine saying what mining do is doing to their lives and what why those companies should not be there and why a bill as one I want should not be approved. So I also like to invite you all to follow Amazon Watch uh, net social net media, also a PB social media and trying to help us in creating this solidarity network in terms uh, around the Amazon and indigenous people's rights. So can what can you say to Brazilians living abroad or friends of Brazil, people who studied in, who have studied in the country or have lived in Brazil and love its people and culture? What is their role in defending democracy in Brazil? First of all, if you're Brazilian, vote and not for Bolsonaro. That is the one of the main campaigns from the US Network for Democracy in Brazil and the W uh, Washington office. So we need to take Bolsonaro of the power. This is the first test we have as Brazilian living abroad. We have to register and you can do this until May and it's easy and you need to vote because it's not that all the problems will be like over. We will still have the Congress in the, name, the hands of those people, but we will need again a democratic president in power. And the second one for those that are friends of Brazil, there are many ways that you can show your solidarity. Like we have an open space for you to join us in this US Network for Democracy in Brazil. Please follow us, please participate in our meetings. We have campaigns going on and we also have an important role of helping those social movements in Brazil by funding them. They are the one they are resisting and they are resisting a huge economic crisis. They are resisting lost and lack of funds that used to come from social programs so to keep the movement strong, we need solidarity. So join us and support those movements. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today on Brazil Unfiltered. It was really wonderful to learn about what Amazon Watch is doing, your fine leadership uh, in this project. And I'm looking forward to collaborating with you on many projects in the future. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am the one to thank the invitation. It was a pleasure to talk, Jim, as always. I hope that you enjoyed the interview. Brazil Unfiltered is part of the Democracy Observatory and is supported by the Washington Brazil Office. If you missed our live broadcast of Dia uh, Dialogues for Democracy, where experts discussed future electoral scenarios regarding the 22 Brazilian elections, please check out the video of the event, which is available on this channel. If you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the video. And if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a five-star review to help other people find the program. Until next time, até a próxima.